Oh, another lesson on being spirit-filled. Still in Ephesians 5. And uh, we've been speaking under that umbrella now for a while. And we last time I was with you, we looked at three things that happen when you're filled with the Spirit, generally speaking. The first one is in verse 19. You are singing, okay? Second thing that happens, you are saying thanks. And then the third thing that happens in verse 21, you are submitting to others. But if there's anything new in the Christian life, when you get saved, the scriptures would indicate it would be a new song. A song of redemption born out of the indwelling spirit of God that breaks forth in praise from the joy that there is when we are controlled by God's Holy Spirit. First word in your outline is the word redemption. It gives us a new song. And this, I think, I want to say that the reason why in the, of these three things, music is the first or singing is the first, I think is because God loves music. Amen? And so let us pick up with that thought tonight. Again, we started it last week, but we'll pick it up again. And in First Chronicles 16, 4 and 5, we see David instituting a choir. And David was a master musician. He was noted for his ability musically. And it must have been quite a, quite, quite a choir. Later on in First Chronicles, Solomon, uh, in the temple, it tells us that Solomon had a 4,000 voice choir. 4,000 voices. That must have been a, a great choir. And it wasn't that they just came to practice once a week. A lot of these people, that was their job, to sing. They were trained to sing. When Ezra speaks about rebuilding the temple, uh, when Zerubbabel came back, uh, you know, as they began to rebuild the temple, they didn't have a big temple after their uh, terrible captivity in Babylon. But one of the first things they did, it says in Ezra 2, is that they put together a choir. 200 people, but it was always important for the God, people of God to have the choir. And as I alluded to, the Levites, the priests, some of the priests were trained and skilled musicians. And I think, you know, if you know kids, uh, your children, grandchildren, that have an inclination in regards to music, a propensity towards music, I think you should challenge them in that direction because to be a skillful musician is a great thing because especially in the church of God because it helps us express our praise to Jesus Christ. Okay? Nehemiah chapter 12 speaks about antiphonal singing. Are you familiar with antiphonal singing? Antiphonal singing appears to be one of God's favorite kinds of uh, singing. And I'll talk about that more later. But antiphonal singing, you have a choir on one side, and you have a choir on the other side, and they sing at each other, sometimes individually, sometimes together. And it seems as if God likes that type of singing. Of course, we know from what we read in the Old Testament especially that they had a lot of instruments, not an expert on these instruments, but uh, they had stringed instruments, wind instruments. They even had, yes, they had drums. That's, but that, and that's what it says in the Bible. They had what we call membranophones. They're uh, drums made out of the membranes of animals, leather, if you will. And they would, they would play them uh, either as they sat on the ground or they play them uh, on their sides. But uh, uh, some handheld. They had timbrels. They had bells. Of course, we're familiar with the, the string in- instruments, the harp, uh, dulcimer, uh, which isn't uh, a 
dulcimer is struck rather than strummed. It's a wind, uh, a stringed instrument that's struck, kind of like a harpsichord almost. They had harps, they had lyres. Uh, they had an instrument called uh, an asor, A-S-O-R, which was like a, uh, uh, kind of like a, uh, kind of like a harp. So they had a, a sack butt, S-A-C-K-B-U-T, kind of like a trombone. It had a slide thing on it. Uh, trumpet, cornet, flutes, that kind of stuff. And uh, if you weren't, if you didn't have a real good musical ear, you know what you could play? You could play the ram horn. You could play the ram horn because all you had to do was what? Blow. That's all you had to do. Just stick, in, stick, stick to it and blow as hard as you can. So they had a lot of music, a lot of instruments. And these are things that seem to please God and... Uh, Music was the way that the soul could release its expression. And when you come into the New Testament, uh, it's a little different, but we're going to see that the New Testament does not teach the use, uh, does not teach or prohibit the use, it does not prohibit the use of instrumental music, okay? Now, some denominations have picked up that way, but I'm going to show you later on as we go through this study. I'll show you how uh, I believe that's wrong. Uh, But if you look, even in the New Testament, music is very, very important. What's the last thing they did at the Lord's Supper? They sang a hymn. And then Jesus went out and was taken captive, tried and then crucified. But the last thing they did in your outline, the word is sing. They sing a song. They sing a hymn. Disciples got together and sang. Acts chapter 4 if you were to look at Acts chapter 4, I believe one of the early church hymns is contained therein. Uh, I believe that's, you, you see evidence here, Acts 4, 24. It says all these believers got together. And then it says they raised up their voice to God with one accord. Okay? And then they, they kind of give you the words and stuff there. So if they're all singing in one accord, if they're all singing the same thing, what does that lead you to believe? It was a hymn. They knew the song, okay? Because these are a diverse group of people, so it would seem that they knew the words to this song. And what did they sing? They sang, Lord, you are God, who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them and so on and so forth, all the way down through that section there in Acts 4. So we even have text uh, in the New Testament showing us hymns that they sang. And after all, what did... did, uh, Paul and Cyrus do in prison. They sang. What was the end result? It was, well, there was an earthquake, and it brought it. It, it, uh, it was. I think. I think it was remarkable to other people in prison there that they were singing. I think it was a testimony to the to the jailer. First uh, Corinthians fourteen. Paul is talking to the Corinthians. You know, all he does in 1 Corinthians is get on them. And he's talking to them in 14, 15. He's saying, he's speaking to them about correct singing. And he says, look, you sing in the spirit, but you also sing with what? He says, with understanding. He says, when you come together, every one of you has a psalm. And what he's saying is you're all singing different songs at one time. And that's what he means when he says you have to have understanding. You have to be singing the same thing together. You know, uh, it's all right to sing different notes, but you need to be singing the same song, okay? If, if we had uh, eight soloists up here singing eight different songs all at one time, it wouldn't make any sense to anybody. It would be too difficult to handle. So you've got to get uh, music needs to be an orderly thing. Just as, just as much as it needs to be anything else, all right? And you know something? Uh, when Jesus comes back, he's going to set up his millennial kingdom, right? Thousand-year reign on earth. And the curse is going to be reversed. And the angels are going to sing again. And everything in the world is going to be wonderful. And he's going to reign as the prince of peace. And you know what? one of the first things he's going to construct in the temple, in the millennial kingdom? If you look in Ezekiel, where it begins to discuss the details of this temple, 
chapter 40 and following, there's a description of the temple the Lord is going to, to, to construct to glorify Jesus in the millennial period. And one of the most fascinating things about that, in this temple, they're going to build a huge choir loft. Okay? Choir loft is the words in your outline. So if you're a music lover, you're going to have a great time. Uh, uh, I know uh, it's going to be, uh, that's another thing to anticipate in the coming of the Lord. But in the millennial kingdom, there's going to be a great choir, and it gives the dimensions on one side and then on the other side, just like I just described earlier, this antiphonal choir, and they're going to be singing towards each other, and there's going to be a huge, huge choir loft on each side. And uh, so it would seem that this is really something that pleases the Lord. So God feels, I, I'm just trying to give you an idea of how God feels about music. And I wanted to take the time to go into that just to let you know that God loves music. But I think we have to understand that God loves music that reflects the new song of redemption. Music that is the product of a spirit-filled life. That's what God loves. So in the future, it tells us about all this singing and you can go all the way into the book of Revelation, and you can find uh, uh, Go. It's, it's, it might come on and off, but it's flashing. It has no bars. Yes, we have no bars. <laughs> so, is it all right if I keep, can you hear me? Okay. So Ephesians 5.19, I'm going to ask you some questions, of course. These are pretty much rhetorical. The answers are in the, the context of what we're, of what we're studying. And uh, I want you to see how music functions in the church. When uh, spirit-filled people come together, I want you to see how that works in the have we have a light can you hear me all right are you guys good 
Okay. So I want us to see Ephesians 5, 19. Uh, when the spirit-filled people come together, and that's the overriding umbrella of the whole topic, right? Spirit-filled people. I want you to see this is the way the church should be functioning. When spirit-filled people come together, first of all, we should come to see. Because that's an expression of what is within us. And whom do we, and among whom should we sing? Well, the first answer, uh, I want to push the point, but to make the point, <clears throat> we should be, uh, my mind says, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So who should we be singing to? Each other. Okay. And then, at the end of verse 19, it does say the Lord. But first of all, we should sing to ourselves. We should be singing amongst ourselves. And that is a great benefit for God's people. And then it, it adds at the end of verse 19, it says we should be singing to the Lord. So the outline, the outline blanks are ourselves. And then the, last, the next one is the Lord. Okay? And I want you to notice that. And I really feel this is important just to make this mention that the singing of the saints is always among who? The saints. Did you know that? And that's through throughout that's true throughout scripture. You can research that, but I, it has been and I have looked at it, but you'll not ever really find what some people would label evangelistic music as such in the word of God. Now, let me make this comment. I think God can use music to bring somebody to Christ. I really do. I think God can use music to reach a tender heart or a tenderized heart. But I think somewhere in there, there has to be a presentation of the gospel. Okay? And maybe the music will strike a responsive chord that brings about the reaction of belief and salvation. And I believe that. But music is not, I don't believe, primarily designed by God as a tool of evangelism. And yet you will run into people who will tell you, we have an evangelistic music group. Or we have a music group that does this, that goes here and goes there. And I'm not saying that's wrong. And I'll tell you why in a minute. But I don't, I'm not sure if I would label that evangelism. You may, you may use music to get people to come, to get a big crowd of people, but I do believe that sooner or later you better preach Jesus Christ if you want to get a response. And, and for me, that is very, very emblematic of what I did for 15 years. Traveling around the southwestern part of the United States, what did we do? We sang. We always, I, we would go to, full, almost, most of the time, we four-day revivals. We would sing Sunday morning. We would open the service. We would uh, have several specials. The evangelists would come and preach the word of God. Then we would sing during the calling, okay? Sunday night, same thing. Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, same thing. Music was part of what we did, but I believe music is primarily the expression of of a spirit-filled life, and it is a function of our worship. Amen? Yeah. Amen. I appreciate that. Because that's really, I see music uh, as a, as a integral part of our worship. And I really don't think people, I really don't think our music, I really don't think our music is for unsaved people. I, I don't think it is for, and I don't, I, this is another thing I'll say. I don't think it is for us to use people who don't know who, who the Spirit of God. I don't think we should use those people to express our music also. Because, he, in, and it talks about here in uh, Ephesians 5.19, we should be singing amongst ourselves, Okay. And that's not to say, like I've already said, music is a, is, is a, can be a tool whereby 
God might call someone. But it, it's not the primary ingredient unless you have a, unless you have a song that teaches the gospel. And, I, and if there is, there may be some songs that touch on the gospel, but I don't know if they can teach the gospel. But I think that's our music, and it comes from our hearts. Yes, John. Amen. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's... Amen. 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 Yeah, and whatever the Lord might do. John's saying that as he reads that 19th verse, it's emphasized to him that these should be, I believe the last phrase is spirit-filled. You know, these, are, these, are, these should be songs that are, that are an expression of the spirit in our lives. And in in, in it's been my experience that the spirit most uh, aptly demonstrates himself in our lives through the utilization of God's holy word. All right? Amen. I agree. So we're here. We're to have this music amongst ourselves directed towards each other and the Lord, and that's the primary use of music. It should be used in our worship. It should be used in our corporate sh uh, sharing. It should be a celebration of our life together in Christ and as a praise to him. And, uh, and our music really isn't a music for the world now. Our music can, can, can touch hearts in the world but it's not designed for the world because the world is on the outside looking in. And I think sometimes it's kind of sad when we so much want to sing our songs to the world that we take our songs and we put our songs into the world's vernacular. And then we think that's evangelistic in nature when really that's not the point for music in the scripture. We are to sing amongst ourselves. Amen? Anybody? Anybody want to get after me? So, and you know, have you ever been to a church where they don't sing? Yes. Have you ever been to a church where there's no instruments? Yes. And there's a, there's a, there's, when you go to a church where there's no singing, they're missing out. Now, there is something to be said for a cappella, you know, for voices that are singing without any musical instruments. But after a while, that can, be, that can get kind of old in a hurry. But you know the Roman Catholic ch Church forbid music for over 1,500 years. Did you know that? The word, the word in your outline are the numbers 1 and 5, 1,500 years. And it didn't, music was not brought back into the Roman Catholic Church until the Reformation. And you'll notice, if you look at some of your old, old uh, hymns, a lot of those hymns were written by reformers. Okay? Uh, some of them were really great hymn writers, and I think one of the reasons why is because they miss music so much. So one of the first things the great reformers did was to put music back into the church, music back for the people to sing, because it had been left out so long, and they were missing part of that. So when you come, when you come to new life, we try to sing. We, uh, I believe, uh, that's a fair. A, we try to, we try to, we try to sing a, a kind of an up tempo song to begin the service, to make sure you're awake, get your attention, get you ready for, get you ready for uh, praising the Lord, and then we try to do a. A set of songs that uh, we believe reflect uh, worship upon the Lord. Uh, try to pay, pay him credit for all he's due. And, uh, you know, and there's oftentimes, and you know, uh, I love to sing. I'm not going to be singing very much in the future. i got to get off the platform. Uh, but I love to sing. And one of the, one of the neatest things for me is when 
I, uh, when we sing a song, and then the, the, the musicians kind of stop playing and we just sing together, to hear the voices of God's people singing a song like that, I just, I just love to hear God's people sing about God. Okay? So that's the first thing. We are to sing amongst ourselves. The second thing, where should our, where should our song come from? From where is our song generated? What's the point of origin of our song? And if you look in verse 19, at the end of the verse, it says singing and making melody, and then you see the phrase, in your heart. Now I'll say this, that that word in is not in the better manuscripts. So it would say singing and making melody, your heart. That's, and, and, and I, I think that's important enough that I mention it. It is implied by the case in which it is written that, that there, are, uh, there are more than one possibility here. And, you know, I, I look at some, some, some stuff like this and I end up chasing it around for a while. And I can spend three hours on those three words, in your heart. And if you, I wish Sally was here tonight uh, as a Greek student. Uh, it could mean, there's two meanings that could be here. It could be that, yes, your heart is what is making and singing this melody. Or it could be that because of the condition of your heart, you're making and singing this melody. Do you see the difference? Yeah. It's, it could be considered to be causative in nature. Your, your singing and making melody is caused by the condition of your heart. I had somebody to come up to me last week after we, or two weeks ago, after the first lesson on this thing on singing, and they told me that they started singing songs that night on the way home, and they'd had the best week of their life in a long time because they were singing every day. So if you don't have a song in your heart, and you remember... You don't have to be a, a singer to sing, just making joyful noise. But you need to have a song in your heart. So it's, a, it's, 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 it's this idea, I want you to see that this singing, this, uh, these melodies are caused by our hearts to the Lord. The word in your hotline is the word hearts. So it's a heart matter. It's a heart issue. Our songs are from our heart. They're caused by our hearts. And if, and if you're not... If you don't have that in your, in your heart, uh, you won't be able to sing those praises to the Lord. You can't sing it. You can't sing it. Listen, if your heart's not, listen to me. If your heart's not right, you can't sing it the way God wants it sung. All right? Psalm 137 is such a great example of the heart. Israel has been captured. And they have been taken to Babylon. And their hearts are broken. So how do they respond to their broken hearts? Listen to Psalm 137.1. Listen to the sadness of these words. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion, speaking of Israel. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. They don't want anything to do with their instruments. They just hang them on trees. For there those who carried us away captive asked of us a song. The Babylonians said, we want to hear one of your songs. And those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, sing of us, sing us one of those songs of Zion. And they respond, verse 4, How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? They said, they hung their harps on the willow. See, they had no song in their heart because their hearts were broken. There was no song in their voice because they were so sad. They just couldn't sing. They couldn't entertain the Babylonians because there was nothing in them 
to give. And you know, in some ways, I admire the fact that they didn't sing. Because to sing joyful songs would to be almost be hypocritical. And they weren't, they weren't going to do it just to perform. They weren't going to do it to act like they were in show business. If there wasn't a song in their heart, if there wasn't a song caused by their heart, there, then there wasn't a song on their lips and they weren't going to sing. If there wasn't any music to play, if, there, if they had hung up their harps in the willows, they weren't going to take them back down, not in that condition. And if you don't have a song in your heart, you really don't, you really don't have much credibility when you sing it from your lips. Let me say that again. If you don't have a song in your heart, you can't really sing one with much credibility from your lips. Now, there's people who will sing for money, right? There's people who sing for fame. There's people that will play musical instruments out of pride. And these people usually function without the Spirit of the Lord. They sing or perform or whatever it might be without being spirit-filled. But that is not the song that the Lord wants to hear from us. That's the kind of song you sing, but you don't really sing it. And if you come to New Life on Sunday morning, and you sing because everybody else sings, and if you come to life, New Life on Sunday morning and you're bitter towards God, and you're angry towards God, I just assume you're not saying. You know why? Because God don't want to hear your song. And that's the truth. He doesn't want to hear your song. Your heart needs to be right. If you have a, the opportunity to stand up and sing a solo, then you're welcome to sing a solo for us anytime. Or if you want to play a song for, your, for us. But if, you're not, if your heart's not filled with the Spirit of God, don't do it. Because I don't want you to be hypocritical because God, I think, will chasten you because our song is the song of the redeemed and the song of those that are filled with the Spirit of God. Amos said, the prophet, Amos indicted the people of Israel because they kept singing even though they had wrong hearts. Amos 5, 21, God says, to the pra- through the prophet, I hate, I despise your feast days, and I do not savor your sacred assemblies, even though you offer me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them, nor will I regard your fattened peace offerings of your fat beasts. Take away from me the noise of your songs, for I will not hear the melody of your string instruments, but let justice rain down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Let me give you the Madeira's paraphrase. Until you get your act together, I ain't interested in your offerings or your music. What does it say? What did Mr. Wagner always used to tell his sixth graders? God isn't interested with your offerings. He's interested with your obedience. That's either first or second Samuel. I think it's first Samuel. But God wants to hear the song of the redeemed, and that song comes from a spirit-filled life. Uh, and so... I've spent all this time on this, and I'm still not done with it. Oh, I'm almost done with it. But music is a very high priority for God. It, song is a very high priority. And listen, if you've, ever, if you've ever felt like you should sing a song for the Lord, and you haven't, that's just as bad as singing when you shouldn't be singing, because you should sing it. But a song is a release of the heart that God has touched. And that's why our music has to be different music because our, see, the Spirit of God is totally unique. 
The Spirit of God is not like the rest of the world, and thus our music can't be like the rest of, a, of the, the world. And ours can, can't be what theirs is, because God's system is not like their system. And this is one of the first things that happens in a Christian's life. You know, I remember back when the Lord called me to be a child of God, one of the first things that happened was my music changed. You know, I didn't know any Christian songs. I remember the Christian songs of my youth in the Methodist church. Uh, and I used to sing in the choir. Even when I was a little kid, I sang soprano. And, uh, but for years, you know, my, the music I listened to was nothing but worldly music. But when the Lord filled my, filled my heart, he changed that desire. And I'm, I'm glad, glad that God has taken music to give us the opportunity to express ourselves. And I'm thankful that the Lord has kind of made this first of these three things. I'm, I'm thankful that he made music singing the first one. That when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, which is the, the topic here, the first result is our singing these spirit-filled songs. And I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad. You know, I consider that, and I consider that to be God's, part of God's graciousness to us. It's, part, it's a, an example of his grace, okay? So, if you're leading a spirit-filled life, you're leading a life, that is, because of your heart, is causing you to sing spirit-filled music. And, you know, it doesn't even have to be a song that you know. It can just be a tune, I love you, Lord, over and over. But that's the first thing we see here in Ephesians 5, 19. And next time, we're going to look at how being spirit-filled affects our relationship to God, and then the last, the last part, we're going to look at how being spirit-filled uh, affects our relationship with everybody around us, all right? So it's, it's cool, because the first one is kind of like God said, here, Steve, I'm going to give you this. This is for you, and then... Steve, this is part of my new relationship with you. And then, Steve, this is for everybody around you. You see how perfect God is? Everything in his word, this is one verse, and it speaks so much about what God has for his people. We're so, so fortunate to be God's people. Amen? Questions or comments, anyone? I went a little fast, but yeah. anybody? All right. Well, thank you for coming. I always appreciate it.